1920, WBSM presents Spooky South Coast with your hosts, Tim Weisberg and Matt Costa. Good evening and welcome to Spooky South Coast. Tim Weisberg here, along with the silent assassin, Matt Costa, and science advisor, Matt Moniz. We are all here. And uh, we are glad to be here talking about the paranormal as we are each and every Saturday night. Except for last week, we weren't here because we had a Legend Trips event at the Lizzie Borden Bed and Breakfast. Dead of Winter 2013, and it went really well. We had a lot of cool experiences going on. Definitely a lot of stuff had happening in the basement. Uh, I had that little shadow figure running all around downstairs. And it's something that we'll be talking about over the course of the night because tonight's uh, show is going to be about investigating haunted locations, and we're going to be joined in just a minute by our friend John Tobin of Glory Haunt Hounds, and, and John does a lot of work uh, investigating historical locations and also bringing, them people, uh, bringing people to them like we do with Legend Trips, and, uh, but before we get into that, I just want to make a quick announcement about Legend Trips, and that is that we have uh, changed the format of the pricing of the event, because a lot of people were coming at us and saying that uh, they wanted to go to our Haunting the Houghton event, April 5th or the 7th, at the Houghton Mansion in North Adams, Mass., but that they were a little bit concerned about the fact that uh, they would have to buy two nights hotel room stay and that they just couldn't afford the two nights in the hotel. We got a great deal from the Holiday Inn Berkshires of $112 a night, but some people just, you know, they don't want to spend two nights on the accommodations. So we were able to work things out with a new pricing structure. So now it's $149 for the event ticket if you want to come to the party on Friday night. Uh, and then if you don't, you want to just come up for the event and just be there for Saturday, probably stay overnight into Sunday, then that ticket would be $125. And they're both available from legendtrips.com right on the page there. So it's a, it's a little bit more affordable that way if you only want to come and spend one day. You'll miss the party at the Haunted Bar where we're going to have some appetizers out for people and things. Uh, but, you know, it's, I understand it's a tough economy out there right now. You know, you might have been sequestered. So, <laughs> so you need to have a, a, a way to kind of save a little cash. So then there you go. That's how you can do it. You can just come up for the Saturday event itself. $125, get your $112. A uh, dollar hotel room, but there's only like seven rooms left at that price because we had a very limited number and the people are already snatching them up. So I checked before the show, we had seven rooms left. So you got to jump on that deal. But remember, you have to buy your ticket first to be able to get that hotel room deal. So just go to legendtrips.com and click on, click on the link for Haunting the Houghton and uh, you'll be able to find out more about it there. And really, you don't want to drive home. <laughs> if you're from this area, especially from the broadcast range of WBSM, you don't want to make the drive home after the event coming home. You want to be able to stay at the hotel. Moniz, I know you've been up there, and it's it's kind of a hike. Yeah, it's a, a two-and-a-half-hour uh, two drive, depending upon the weather. For you, on Google Maps and on my uh, navigator, it says that it's like three-and-a-half, four hours. So it's two-and-a-half hours, by the way, the way you drive. drive. Yeah. So for everybody else who obeys the speed limit, <laughs> it would take you a lot longer. All right, well, why don't we get right into things with tonight's guest. John Tobin is the host of Keeping the Spirits Alive on Para-X and founder of the Paranormal Network Glory Haunt Hounds. John's interest in the paranormal started when he saw strange shadow figures as a child and peaked when he saw his first full-bodied apparition in his 20s. John has lectured at many functions and appeared on numerous radio and television shows, including 30 Odd Minutes and the biography channel's My Ghost Story. Uh, John has also recently been cast by Deftone Picture Studios and will appear in the horror comedy A Grim Becoming, scheduled for 2014. So please welcome, from Glory Haunt Hounds, our friend and ghost historian, John Tobin. Good evening, John. How are you? Hey, good evening. How are you? Oh, we are spooktacular, as we say here. Very good, very good. Yeah, I know I'm a little bit late, but congratulations on the seven-year anniversary. That's, a, that's, a, that's like a lifetime and a half in this field. So uh, you guys do a great job, and uh, you know, congratulations on that. I'll be a little late. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, I think probably the uh, biggest testament of that is uh, how long our audience has been putting up with us for. <laughs> uh, that goes for anything. I've, I've only been on uh, the airways for you know, about a year, and, and they still have to somehow. So, uh, you know, seven years, is, it's like I said, a lifetime and a half. So congratulations on that. They, they come back every week, thankfully. So. And you would think uh, by now we, we would have figured out all the tech issues, but no. 
<laughs> but you know, technology is great when it works, you know. Right, exactly. And that's something that we find, uh, you know, when we're out there and we're investigating for the paranormal, we have all this tech that we bring with us, all these different devices that some of them are now being made for paranormal investigations, some of them are being adapted for it, and some of them we're completely misusing them, but <laughs> it still seems to get us some kind of a result. So uh, it, it's really interesting, I think, when you bring this technology and this approach, this quote-unquote scientific approach, into a lot of these historic locations that you investigate. Uh, do you find that uh, there's, there's kind of a, a mixture of the two worlds together when you do that? Uh, yeah, you know, it's funny. I, I believe that, uh, you know, when you mix the technology uh, in the real world, it, it, is, it is a funny mix. Um, you know, how, like you mentioned briefly, there are misuse of a lot of the technology and a lot of the tools out there. Um, you know, it's, it, it, it's funny how we can take things that are, are meant for one purpose and repurpose them for the paranormal, and, and now we're taking other tools that are kind of developed along uh, the lines of this, this same technology um, and calling them uh, tools specifically for the paranormal. Uh, but in reality, they're just sort of re redoing what we, we've already been using as, as paranormal tools. So it's all kind of uh, tools that really weren't necessarily meant for this trade, but um, they help to guide us in, in ways, and you know, a lot of times we get good results with this stuff. So yeah, it is a funny mix uh, when we combine technology, especially when you when, th when you think about it. What well, we do a lot of these things, like you guys do with wedding trips, and uh, what I try to do with, with my focus uh, on these historical buildings. We're, we're talking buildings, you know, sometimes a couple hundred years old, and we're using all these you know modern uh, advances that change all the time that we try to get, gather this you know what we like to call evidence with. Uh, and, and uh, you know, it's funny how they can mix together and, um, you know, somehow lead us to, to, to what we consider to be evidence. So, you know, and it's kind of ironic when you really think about it. And, and what's funny about it, too, is that we're investigating a lot of places that, uh, you know, they don't have electricity, or if they do, it's just the regular two-prong ungrounded plugs. <laughs> and we're coming in there with all this stuff that we, we need power strips and... You know, we have to start bringing our own generators with us because we're bringing our own uh, our own energy really in into these locations, and it's probably in a lot of cases uh, more uh, of an energy burst than these places have probably seen. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, uh, I think any time we did a, a, a lot of folks in one location, uh, all asking these questions and using these tools and doing this stuff, uh, you know, whatever happens to be at this location is probably uh, you know more concerned or uh, curious uh, than even we are as paranormal investigators and what we're trying to accomplish, uh, whatever energies or spirits or whatever you want to call them may be at that location, uh, probably a lot more confused and a lot more uh, curious of, you know, what we're trying to do uh, than anything else, especially if you subscribe to a couple of different thoughts. Uh, one, they may not know that they're deceased, or uh, B, there may be energies that aren't even deceased people at all that are, that are you know, able to communicate. So depending on how you look at it. Yeah, a little bit later on, I really want to get into the nature of, uh, you know, what you think ghosts are, because I think we have similar theories uh, in a lot of ways, and uh, I'd really like to get into that and how it impacts the hauntings a little bit later on. But uh, now, this year, you're embarking on something called the Para History Tour 2013, and, and what does that exactly entail? Well, what it entails is uh, I'm doing a, a, quite a few lectures around many different places and, and different events that my group, Bloodhound Hounds, is putting on. Um, and with each one, we try to do, uh, the focus is definitely uh, tailored towards history. Um, and we try to go in history first. And what I mean by that, um, you know, I, I'm, I've got different lectures, but I always try to keep them at, at historical locations. Um, and by doing that, if it's a lecture that I'm uh, leading, then I'm bringing more people into these locations to come out and, and see them and to, um, you know, be able to explore them and, and kind of learn the history. One thing that I'll do with my lecture is I always like to give the non-paranormal history of the location. Um, I like to try to bring as much attention as possible to these great locations that often get forgotten. And, and I try to seek out whenever possible locations that may not necessarily have been on all of the different shows and uh, are talked about as, as paranormal or haunted. Um, because there doesn't have to be, you know, amazing life events that have happened at a location, or there doesn't have to have been on every show for there to be great results when you go there. And um, a lot of times, because of this, with these buildings, because they don't go out of their way to present themselves as being haunted, often get forgotten about. And, and as we, um, you know, as as um, more and more, and what I try to think of my stance in the paranormal is, if I can raise more awareness to these, these locations, if I can bring some more attention to them, um, that's my number one. History has always been my number one love, so 
Um, I'm just trying to tailor what I'm doing in the paranormal to try to draw more attention to these locations. So the Pair History Tour um, is trying to educate people on history first and then how the paranormal can combine with that and, and, help, and help history and help preserve it in a way um, by just raising attention and drawing more people to it and just a, a better understanding of uh, why it is these great historic locations should not be forgotten and left to just, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, be abandoned and, and forgotten about in uh, the paranormal community right now being what it is and being so popular and, you know, a lot of the trust, uh, a lot of times we complain about how oversaturated it can be, but this is where groups, you know, people can really make a difference and, and, and you know, I'm only one group and one person here, but I'm trying to make a stand and, and, and show some other people in the paranormal uh, just like you guys do the budget church, you know, just raise awareness and, and, and uh, let these places not be forgotten and let the people that really have an interest in helping uh, find out how they can do that and, and uh, have them have some fun at the same time. All right. And the cool thing that I found, too, is that while we're doing this, uh, we've also become kind of ambassadors for the paranormal community, too, because we're getting into locations that uh, people might not be able to get in and investigate on their own because here we are, you know, we're promising them some fundraising. Yeah, absolutely, and that's the number one thing. Um, you know, I always wait, our event is you know, severely weighted towards the location to help them fundraise. Um, we use several events through the year, at least a few that are strictly 100% fundraising. Um, uh, you know, we did a, a, an event last year, uh, a location that absolutely wanted nothing to be do uh, with being known as paranormal. They didn't want any to do children's programs there. They didn't want anybody to think they were possibly to be. Uh, anything paranormal happening there. And, you know, we went in and said, you know, this is an amazing building. This particular building had been a um, tuberculosis hospital. Uh, it had been a school. It had been a private, private residence. Um, it had been uh, so many different things uh, throughout the years that uh, my thought was is that uh, this is a building now at a historical society um, is basically begging and pleading for things like paper clips and printer ink and things like that. And I'm like, well, uh, it's not so important to me for you to get you, you know, how can I help you is I don't need to come in here and do an investigation. The most important thing for me is what can I do uh, if I can bring, you know, a bunch of people out here and, and listen to me and some of my friends in the paranormal tell ghost stories around Halloween time. Well, there's money for you that way. It doesn't have to be about my paranormal research. The number one thing for me is it's about history. And that's this kind of thing. Um, we got a lot of people into this location that normally wouldn't go there because they had an interest in the paranormal. And even though we weren't doing an investigation event, we were still able to raise a lot of money for... Uh, this great historical society and, and really help pay their bills for the winter. So it's a, it's a great sense of accomplishment when you're able to help somebody else by doing something that you really love to do. And, and one of the best feelings is when people come in there for the first time and they say to you, you know, wow, this place is really cool. I'm so glad I came. I never would have came here if it wasn't for this. And then they just fall in love with the location and, and they go back again and again uh, just for their own interest in, in the history of the spot. Yeah, absolutely. I've had several people say to me, uh, you know, hey, did you hear about the great program that this historical society is running? And they've gone back afterwards to see, you know, a grave rubbing program or a program on um, uh, some of the old historic uh, local uh, uh, civil war battles and things of that nature uh, that aren't even related to paranormal at all, but they're still taking place in the different events that these locations are, are having. And that's just great. That means, you know, you're doing what you want to do uh, by bringing them back more and more and, uh, and getting the attention that they deserve. And, of course, when you do have a relationship with a lot of these locations, you know, they, they look to you for programs and, and events. And uh, we do a lot of work at the Fearing Tavern in our hometown of Wareham. And as part of the deal, I come, I go back and I give uh, some lectures a few times a year with the Wareham Historical Society. And when I had my last one, some of our Legend Trips visitors uh, came back and, and saw the lecture. And they signed up and they joined. And they're now members of the Wareham Historical Society, even though they live 45 minutes to an hour away. And they keep coming back for those programs because they fall in love with the history of the area. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's perfect, Tim. Well, I'm glad that, yeah, you know, that happens. And, and it does. I see it happening around uh, the events we do. Uh, you know, we, we, we uh, have an, an event coming up uh, next weekend, actually, uh, at the Yankee Pavilion in, in Connecticut. And it's funny because I had done actually have seen the many viewers, which is a real way to find out about this. Normally, I would have done a lot of research, but uh, I thought, well, it's close enough. Let's check it out either weekend away and then down there. You know, and discussing with the owner, finding out that uh, they really had a lot of uh, trouble uh, selling rooms in the winter. And the movie is about, you know, the last weekend open, which is fictional. Mm -hmm. uh, but the reality of it all is without, uh, you know, some of the attention that we could help bring them, um, they were in trouble, and they, you know this great location that has been open since 1891. 
um, in this pretty much looks like you walk in there, it looks like 1891. They have old key doors and uh, all the uh, original furniture, not all of the original furniture, but they restored it to look very much like it did when it first opened. Um, and, you know, and, and they said, well, let's, you know, I had this idea. At the time I went there, I didn't think of anything of it. And I said, well, here's what I do, and what if we do this for you? And, you know, he was just, well, yeah, we always have people that want to come in here and rent a room and investigate all night, but well, let's, let's open it up and, and, and have a whole bunch of people come in um, and see the Yankee Peddler and, uh, you know, let's uh, set up this event. So, you know, that's another way of, uh, of drawing attention. It sort of happened by chance, but, uh, you know, the locations that, uh, Sometimes you don't even think you're going to be working with you. You're able to help them in a way that most people wouldn't even think of. Uh, you know, you're a hotel that doesn't go out of their way to uh, promote themselves as paranormal, but the movie comes out, and uh, the director of the movie had this incredible experience, apparently, while he was staying there. And, uh, you know, so, we, you know, we went there, found all over the place, and uh, so that's the kind of location sometimes we look for. We stumble upon them uh, from time to time, but, you know, they're there if you look. And now, uh, reciprocally, uh, hasn't the Yankee Peddler Inn allowed you to do some fundraising events? Uh, I remember you did an event there not that long ago, right? Uh, uh, fundraiser? Actually, this is the first event we've done for the Yankee Peddler, actually. Uh, I know you had, you had another fundraiser, though, last year, right? No, not us. No, this is our first event. They may have had some sort of a, a fundraiser last year. I'm not sure. I'm not, I'm not familiar with it, but this is really the first event we've done for them. Well, I mean... It, it does show, though, how uh, you know the communities can work hand in hand. I, I know, f you know, from some of the uh, people that I've been contacted from, uh, whenever there's money that needs to be raised, you know, the first thought that a lot of people have is, uh, you know, I have this haunted location. What can I do to help? How can we get some people in here and generate some money so we can donate it to this cause? And it's uh, it's fascinating to me that you know we go to these people basically so that we can uh, increase their their profile in the paranormal. Uh, and then they're coming back to us because they want to give back for that reason. Even though, you know, the door might have closed in your face two or three years ago asking people if you could come and investigate for ghosts. And, and now they realize that there are a lot of good people in this field that uh, that do appreciate when a location will open its doors for them. Yeah, absolutely. When I go to a location uh, with an interest of perhaps helping them in some way, either with an event or a fundraiser, uh, I always go in first uh, explaining my love for history and, and letting them know uh, you know, what I might be able to do to help them out. And a lot of times they're reluctant to um, be uh, associated with the paranormal or uh, associated with possible hauntings or ghosts. They may be afraid that um, the reputation that they're trying to uphold is going to be tarnished. Um, but once they find out, you know, how uh, some of the people that, like you mentioned, some of the good people out there can actually help them uh, with the awareness and, and increase the business, and that it's not necessarily and not at all with the negative uh, that it once was or the taboo that the paranormal was, say, even 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Um, you know, sometimes you show them some of your past results and, and it opens their eyes a little bit and like, you know, well, we might not want to be the haunted place, but, uh, you know, let's let the people come in and, and see what they find and, and, and have fun with it. And once they realize that you're just trying to help them, and a lot of times they will open those doors that were slammed in your face four or five times a few years back. Yeah. <laughs> it's... Uh, when you're bringing people into these events and you're introducing them to, uh, you know, the different aspects of paranormal investigation, but also of historical research, uh, that opens up a lot of doors for, for people, too, because a lot of these groups that are out there, you know, they may have the name research in their group name because they need it for the cool acronym. <laughs> but they don't understand, like, how many hours it goes into exploring the history. And, you know, you spend more time in the library and in the basement of the town hall than you do in the actual uh, location itself. And so to have them right there and to have that research slap them in the face while they're having fun uh, investigating, that's that's how you get them jazzed up for that part of, of the paranormal. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that is definitely uh, the best way to get them uh, interested and in jazzed up for um, you know that part of the, uh, you know, the investigation. I, I, do, I agree with you. And for me, you know, there's more of an emphasis on uh, where to go with the investigation if you know the history. I, I know a lot of people like to go in cold and they want to kind of just have the experiences and, and gather the evidence that they do. But in my case, I like to have some sort of directive. I like to have a narrative to the investigation before I get started. Uh, how about yourself? Wh which way do you prefer to go in when you're investigating a spot for the first time? I'm going to I like to have the history, the background, and, and you know, I, I hear the same things. You know, people will say, oh, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to bias your, your thoughts or your, your questions or the things, the way you do your investigation. Um, 
But I, I'm a firm believer that the more knowledge you have about a location, it's not going to skew it because um, I do have another belief that not necessarily all the things we're looking for are deceased people. Mm-hmm. Uh, I believe that a lot of the energy, individual energy, and, and even intellectual energy that's left behind um, that can possibly interact uh, with us during our investigations um, could just come from the thousands upon thousands of people that may have been at this location throughout the years. And like I said, we'll get into that in a little bit. But um, without that history, I might not have an idea of the particular events or types of people or things that may have happened at that location which are key to me um, in the way I, I go about doing my research and the way I try to present uh, an investigation with uh, the public and how I like to try to look for uh, these things. So I think if you just focus on uh, a particular event or one particular thing, um, even if you don't do your research, and, and that's what I mean, a lot of people will go into these locations without doing their research, but they'll know that there was a fire there and two people were murdered or died, it's not murdered, but died, and they, they know the names of these two people. So we'll go in there and they'll just constantly ask questions over and over again. Hi, is Bob there? Is, you know, can I talk to Bob? And Bob's here, turn my flashlight on, and whatever. <laughs> so, um, but there might be, you know, 20 other energies in the location that are not responding because they're only trying to talk to Bob. So I think it does a lot more for us to know the full history of the building. Um, to know what types of people have been there, what types of events, not necessarily for a particular person as much as maybe a particular point in time that you want to refer to. Right, and I don't mean to soapbox here a little bit, but I mean, a paranormal investigation is, you know, part investigation and part experimentation. And Moniz is a scientist, you know, he doesn't just grab two random chemicals and say, geez, I wonder what happens if I mix these, well, you might, but, uh, <laughs> you know, most scientists wouldn't just grab two random chemicals and say, I wonder what happens when I mix these together. You would go into it with some kind of idea of how they would react with one another, and, and you'd have a, a hypothesis of what would happen. And same thing with investigation. If you're a homicide detective, you don't just randomly show up at a location and be like, hey, anybody got killed here recently? Right. You know, like you, you have to go into it with a plan and, and, and with, uh, with a methodology. Oh, yeah, yeah, I agree with you 100%, but you'd be surprised at how many, well, you wouldn't be surprised, but you know how many people would go in there and just say, hey, uh, anybody here want to talk to us? And just sort of pause and not have anything other than that really gone. So, uh, yeah, I, I do think the history is a key and uh, in, information, anything you can gather. And like you said, um, you know, people may think it's funny that we spend hours at a historical society or a library or uh, you know, anything like that to, to get this information. But, you know, uh, knowledge is key, and it, it can only help, and certainly doesn't hurt in any way whatsoever. I mean, that's, I, you know, I stand firm in that belief. And I, I do have to say, a lot of the times, I understand some investigators, uh, when they say they want to go in there cold, and I do respect a lot of investigators that, that do take that approach, but many of them are taking that approach too because they're, they're lazy. They don't want to do the work. They want to go in there and get a name and then have to go and research just that particular name, for example. You know, they, they don't want to go in there with, uh, you know, 250 years of history in their back pocket and have to hope that something that they get fits into all of that. You know, they want to have a more directed part of the research instead of a directed part of the experiment. Retroactive uh, the research is basically right. what it winds up being. Oh, I got this name, and then you go research in the records. I found Jim in the records. Well, <laughs> the, the, there could have been 15 other Jims and stuff, and there's five Toms, and you, you know what and, I'm saying? If you knew that going in ahead of time, it, it isn't a special. But, John, too, uh, this goes back to, to some of our similar theories on investigation. I'll talk about this with you in the next hour, but uh, when... You do go in there with a history already in mind that can taint things depending on what it is that's the cause of this activity. Um, if, if we're thinking about, say, John Smith, who lived at that location, then we might manifest John Smith. You're right. I mean, I understand that philosophy as well. But I, I, I you know, that's, knowing the history and, and knowing, uh, say, you go to a location and you find out that uh, four people died there and you actually have the four names. Um, when I do my investigations, I don't know how you approach it, Tim, but um, I will never particularly ask for those names. Um, I will conduct my questioning and my research and the things that I try to do um, around uh, different uh, you know, parts of the research that I've conducted, but I, I don't specifically look for that person. And it's not to say at any point I'm not going to say, you know, is this person uh, here to see if there's any reaction. And certainly, um, if you're doing an event and there's a lot of folks out there and you're letting them participate, the questioning is going to come up. There's really not any way to avoid that, so that's going to happen. But my personal kind of I like to let the, you know, and this is going to sound a little corny, but I like to let the location speak to me. 
Um, so if I'm getting a particular, uh, and I don't know how to describe it, but you get a, sort of a feeling or a vibe about how things are going in your line of questioning, it's like a feeling I get. It doesn't mean I, I can't really explain it, but, um, I, you know, if, if I'm approaching something the right way, uh, it is, you'll just kind of know. I don't know. Uh, but if you're really just searching for those four people, you know, what about the other 10,000 people that right. have been to the location? So, uh, you know, I, I found that to be a bad approach. Unfortunately, running an event, and, you know, we like to let a lot of other people do the questioning and move the equipment and things like that. So those questions will inevitably come up. I mean, if we get results from them, great, but uh, certainly don't want to focus it on that. Right. Well, we are coming up on the news break here. Uh, when we come back on the other side, we will talk more with our guest, John Tobin. We'll also take your calls, 508-996-0500, 1-877-996-1420. You can also email us, SpookyCrew, at SpookySouthCoast.com. Uh, we mentioned a, a few events here. If you want to get tickets to ours, it's LegendTrips.com. And, John, if they want to get tickets to your event, that's at GloryHauntHounds.com. Correct. And you can get to that page. Uh, if you look right on Spooky TV at SpookySouthCoast.com, we are running the, the web address up there throughout the course of the show. And uh, we've got Matt Costa on directing tonight because I'm sitting in his seat. So uh, he's adding all kinds of fancy graphics over there. And Moniz, he'll show you how to do it. Yeah. So uh, there you go. <laughs> That's why we have so much problem with the tech because we just can't stop trying new bells and whistles. All right, we're going to try a few more during the news break. Uh, again, we'll be back in just a few minutes talking more with John Tobin about investigating historic locations. And we want to hear about your experiences investigating haunted locations. Again, 508-996-0500, 1-877-996-1420. Email spooky, so spooky crew at SpookySouthCoast.com or in the chat room at SpookyTV at SpookySouthCoast.com. We'll be right back with more here on Spooky South Coast. The station the South Coast turns to for local news, talk, weather, and sports. WBSM New Bed. For AM 1420 WBSM. From ABC News, I'm Chuck Severson. Called off a dangerous and seemingly impossible effort to rescue a man swallowed up with his bedroom by a sinkhole under his house Thursday. For the Hillsborough County Administrator, Mike Merrill says Jeff Bush is presumed dead. To have one occur right in the center of a home and certainly to injure and even kill somebody is. I've never heard of that happening before. Sinkhole is growing. The house in Sifner, Florida is to be demolished tomorrow, says ABC's Gio Benitez at the scene. But it's just simply unstable. That is what they've said. They have no other choice. Uh, so we've seen family members bringing flowers to that house. Uh, we've seen them breaking down in tears because, as you can imagine, not only do they lose someone that they love so much, but they're also losing their entire life. It is its policy to not do CPR, but to call emergency, says a Bakersfield, California retirement home after an elderly woman being cared for died Tuesday following a nurse's refusal to do CPR. The 911 dispatcher. I understand if your boss is telling you you can't do it, no. but if there's any... Uh, yeah, as a human being, I don't, you know, is there anybody that's willing, yeah. that's willing to help this lady and not let her die? Um, not at this time. Glenwood Gardens Home says it's doing an eternal review. U.S. officials are trying to confirm whether a top al-Qaeda terrorist, Mokhtar Belmokhtar, has been killed in Africa. The Chad military claims it. Belmokhtar is the suspected mastermind of January's attack on the hostage crisis in Algeria, in which more than 30 hostages were killed, including three Americans. Telling its 35 million plus users to change passwords. The popular cloud service Evernote saying it's been hacked. Customer data, including passwords, stolen. ABC News Technology Editor Joanna Stern. The important thing is, of course, keeping track of those passwords, and that can be harder to do. There are a number of password manager applications that allow you to keep your passwords, keep the list of the accounts. The good thing about those is those are actually also encrypted. You're listening to ABC News. Introducing a faster way to push to talk. AT&T Enhanced Push to Talk. AT&T delivers more of what your business needs. Instant communication, up to 1,000 contacts, plus a broad array of devices and platforms. Visit your local AT&T store or call 1-877-981-3359 to get your business started today. You push to talk, we pushed it further. AT&T, we think possible. Your activations only requires two-year commitment to eligible voice and data plans, plus activation of AT&T Enhanced Push to Talk service. You may have noticed doctors and nurses using the Exergen Temporal Scanner Thermometer in hospitals and clinics. That's because it gives a fast, accurate reading with just a gentle forehead scan, backed by more than 40 published medical studies. It's a huge time saver, which makes it a great money saver too. Now, what you may not have noticed is that doctors and nurses use the Exergen Temporal Scanner Thermometer at home too, for all the same reasons. 
So why not get one for your home? Pick one up today at Target and other fine retailers. More than a dozen California families have spent the week camping out in Huntington Beach to be first in line to buy one of 11 new houses being built. Today was the first day to buy, starting price tag 800 grand. ABC's Darsha Phillips in Huntington Beach. We haven't seen people camping out to buy a home in a very long time. Experts say it's a sign that California's housing market is turning around and buyers want to jump at the chance of a good deal and low interest rates while they still can. This warning. The new U.S. Secretary of State, John Kerry, is in Cairo, where he has offered some blunt words, telling Egypt's bickering government and opposition leaders they need to work together around human rights and religious tolerance as well as economic reform if Egypt is to move forward. Kerry warned that investment and jobs will not come to Egypt until the country is stable and business feels secure. Jeffrey Kaufman, ABC News, London. Soccer heart monitors could become standard. In some distress as well. Fans horrified watching soccer player for British Mwamba's heart stop for several minutes in the middle of a match last year. Doctors managed to revive him, but now the International Football Association is studying whether all players should wear heart monitors in order to see if they're playing so hard they risk a fatal heart attack. Fabrice Mwamba is retired from the game, but he's now urging more facilities to add automatic defibrillators like the one that saved his life. Andy Field, ABC News. This is ABC News. Trying to sell your old car? Instead, donate your vehicle to Heritage for the Blind. Pickup is free and your donation is tax deductible. Just call 1-800-895-8035. Heritage for the Blind accepts cars, vans, trucks, and boats, whether they run or not. Donate your vehicle and you'll receive a free three-day vacation voucher to over 50 locations. Call 1-800-895-8035. That's 1-800-895-8035. Chuck Severson, ABC News. It takes 12 years to create a graduate. It takes about the same time to create a dropout. The difference between a child becoming one or the other could be you. Studies prove that reading to a child regularly dramatically improves reading skills. And kids who read well by third grade are four times as likely to graduate. So United Way is calling for one million volunteers over the next three years. We're asking you to step up, make a pledge, tutor a child who needs help, mentor a kid who needs someone on their side, volunteer to read to children, make a difference. Because when a child advances, we all advance. Entire communities improve. The path to success or failure starts long before graduation day. And the difference between a graduate and a dropout could be you. Be a reader, tutor or mentor. Give, advocate, volunteer. Live United. Take the pledge. Go to liveunited.org now. Brought to you by United Way and the Ad Council. Here, on the side of the house? Who said that? Look down. I'm right at your feet. Wait, the basketball? Yes, the basketball. Right down here, where the kiss left me a long time ago. Man, you know how lonely it is being a ball and not being able to bounce or roll? Excuse me? Remember when you got me for the kids? You said, now kids, you have no excuse not to go outside and play. Uh-huh. Wow. I miss flying through the air and hearing the shouts of joy when I swish through the basket. What do you say? Could you give me a little air and remind the kids of how fun I still am? Okay. Oh, wow. You are flat. <laughs> Easy. I'm ticklish. Let's get bouncing. As Native American parents and caregivers, our encouragement to healthy lifestyles for our kids is helping them get outside and play. Get ideas. Get involved. Get going at letsmove.gov slash Indian Country. Brought to you by USDA, HHS, and the Ad Council. Oh, I love this song. But you know what? I bet it would sound even sweeter in a Honda certified used car. You know, if you upgraded. Because each one gets a thorough 150 point inspection and comes with a Carfax vehicle history report. So you'll know where it's been. So you can relax. So you'll be happier. Food will taste better. And music will sound even sweeter. All because you bought a great late model Honda certified used car. Good thinking. Would you ever get such a magnificent idea? All right, I'm out of here. Drive safely. Welcome to Spooky South Coast of Canada. 
supernatural is something that isn't supposed to happen, but it does it. AM 1420, WBSM presents Spooky South Coast with your hosts, Tim Weisberg and Matt Boston. Welcome back, our number two of Spooky South Coast. Tim Weisberg here, along with the Asylum Assassin, Matt Costa, and Science Advisor, Matt Moniz. And we played musical chairs here. I'm still over here in the big, did. The big chair. I've never sat in a seat before. Really? That's yeah. why you haven't. It's weird. It's strange to me. And uh, in, in all the time that you were away, um, I didn't stand the entire time. Really? So In protest? Right. So <laughs> I had a sit-in over here behind the board. So I don't know if I could ever get back to, to the standing again, especially now that we have the monitor over here so I can see the chat room. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And uh, we were talking off the air about maybe changing that chat format since it's Flash chat and a lot of people yeah, can't run Flash sure anymore. People are uh, bored with it or I don't know. I know a lot of people do like it. So I know, and I like it because you can bring your username from, from yeah. chat box so to chat box. It's so easy to put on the website. I know, but <laughs> I need to be able to use it over here. Yeah. How about instead of changing sure. it, why don't you just figure out a way to make it work over here? Might be easier that way. Yeah. It might be. So we might need admin capabilities to do that too, but I don't know. Any Zat chat experts, <laughs> give us a call and we'll figure it out. But, you know, we, we do what we can here on the show. We, we try to keep things going as best we can. And uh, we try to innovate and come up with new ideas. And uh, so with that in mind, in the presence of trying to do new and different things, uh, next week we're going to be flying in Chris Balzano for the show. Are we? <laughs> yeah, actually. He's going to be here in the studio. <laughs> that's the plan as of right now. Um, like, do we have like an Air Force One type plane that's gonna go pick him up? No, I think it's just regular, regular, yeah. regular. But it's not costing us a thing. Oh, is it? Right. And I can't tell you anyone that. Uh, but good. there's, there's. Let's just say there's a project in the works. And uh, with that in mind, I do want to put the call out there for anybody that's in the local area uh, in Massachusetts, Rhode Island. Uh, anywhere here in, in southern New England, if you have a haunted, cursed, or possessed object that's still in your possession, uh, if you could let me know, Tim at SpookySouthCoast.com, let me know about the item, let me know about the story, uh, because Chris and I are working on a little project, and we may need to come and pay you a visit and check it out. So, uh, again, Tim at SpookySouthCoast.com, uh, let us know. Uh, we need to know by next week. So try to let us know by, like, the middle of the week this week, and uh, hopefully we can... Come by and check it out because, as I said, you know, top top secret project. But you know, hush you know hush. it's very hush hush. It is very hush hush. hush. But we'll I'll, I'll tell you off the air. So mm. I know you were kind of out of the loop a little bit this week. I didn't want to bother you this week. Yeah, you yeah. know, all that was going on. So I'll uh, I will inform you after the show. Good, good. All right, all right. End the show now. I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> no, Hit the closing we, credits. We can't on the show now because we've still got so much to talk about with our guest uh, tonight, John right. Tobin. Oh, uh, so of Glory Haunt Hounds, and you can check out the website GloryHauntHounds.com. And uh, John, what, what brought about that name? I have to ask. Oh, well, that's funny you ask. Uh, Glory Haunt Hounds. Uh, a lot of people ask me that question, uh, as you might es- expect. But uh, uh, no, it's not uh, religious in any way, and uh, it doesn't uh, make fun of. Uh, a uh, paranormal uh, glory haunt, so looking for any glory or fame or anything like that. What it really it stems from um, is when I first moved out to the Albany, uh, New York area, which was about three years ago or so, um, I was with, uh, I had done independent research for gosh, close to 20 years and decided to hook up with my first actual team and check that out and see what I was all about. And it had fun for a couple of years, and um, I had some huge differences with the leader of that particular group, and I won't mention any names here, but um, they were not so much into the historical locations. They were, you know, one of the teams out there that had a sincere wish to try to help folks, uh, you know, with their uh, um, private in-home hauntings and things like that. And, you know, there's a need for, for those types of groups. Unfortunately, there's uh, uh, lots of them out there that uh, don't have any idea what they're doing, but uh, they're, they were sincerely trying to help these people, but uh, on the same token, I love history and I love these historical locations, and you know, uh, every time we bring up a particular location that we'd like to go to, the leader of the group like, oh, this is the glory hunt, this is the glory hunt, we don't want to be involved in that, and you know, everybody likes to go there, and uh, anyone, you know, all these places, and and uh, really kind of putting down these great historical locations that we all loved him, and 
I took it to heart, and I, you know, when I just made the decision to leave that group and start my own thing and, and trying to think of a name, two things I didn't want to do. One, I didn't want to use the word paranormal, mm-hmm. uh, because everybody does that, and there's nothing clever or creative left. But no offense to anyone who has it in their name, it certainly lets people know what you do, so I understand the purpose for it, but I didn't want it for me. And uh, I thought, okay, well, let's take Glory Hunt, because that's what we, uh, if he wants to associate them with these places and call, call these places, these very historic places, this. We'll call them the Glory Hunt. Sure, we, we, we think it's glorious that these places even are around. So we did Glory Hunt, and then we added the word hounds um, because hounds go around sniffing out things and looking for stuff and trying to find stuff and, and uh, looking for answers and always curious. So uh, I thought it had a nice ring to it. And, uh, you know, uh, I've been called everything under the sun since I used that name, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's stuck with us, and so Glory Hunt, Hound it is. Well, and, and that's the thing. I mean, if you can have a name that... Uh, gets people talking one way or the other, then, you know, you're, you're getting the word out there. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and that's it. You know, the, the name is a little bit distinctive, we think, and so it stands out a little bit. And, uh, you know, I'd like to think that as we do a little bit more and more, people start remembering that. And, uh, you know, uh, you can hear Blank Paranormal Group a thousand times, and unless the group is doing something completely significant, it's going to be a lot harder for that particular group to stand out, and hopefully our actions will help us stand out, not so much the name, but if it helps people remember who we are, then that's great. And that's why, you know, people think all the time that Spooky South Coast is a, is a paranormal group, and uh, and I have to explain to them, no, we're not a group, we're just a radio show, but we do investigate, not necessarily as the show, but with other teams and and, uh, and independently. And so, uh, you know, with the intention of getting a name out there that will p- make people pay attention, if I ever do start a group, I'm calling it We Fake Paranormal. Because <laughs> that will definitely get people talking. <laughs> we'll get people talking for at least a month, and then it'll fade away like all the other uh, acquisitions of taking that has happened in the last and, few months. Well, that's when we go up and we get our black T-shirts from Cafe Press, and then hey, kind, oh, of, kind of remind everybody. That'll remind. That'll come, keep coming back. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> so uh, while while we're talking a little bit about Glory Hunt Hounds, I want to let people know about the uh, the Parrot History Con. Oh yes, absolutely. This is uh, coming up in April. Coming up quick, April 26th and 27th, uh, out at uh, Fort William Henry, which is another great historical place. Um, uh, you know, French and Indian War, uh, their huge massacre, and uh, a great people at a great location. And, uh, you know, the thought of putting on a pair of history con came to me and uh, my buddies at uh, Beyond Ghosts out in uh, Buffalo. Uh, we started talking about it. Um, what if we put together, you know, everybody has a convention these days, and um, they're all over the place, but what if we did a focus? Uh, convention on history and uh, the paranormal and history and and brought in people that have uh, a background of some sort of historic significance in uh, work in the paranormal and ask them to tell their, their great lectures and, and provide information on some of the great historical places that they tend to like uh, and that they, they'd like to uh, raise a little bit more awareness from. Not necessarily the most popular place to go to or um, not even necessarily their, their favorite location, but uh, a great historical location that they'd like to pay attention to. So when people come to the Bear History Con, not only are they going to have the chance to meet a lot of the people that they like from TV, radio, and uh, different facets of the paranormal, um, they'll also have the uh, experience of hearing a lecture tailored towards para- the paranormal and history at a great historical location, and also get a chance to uh, do a ghost investigation with, alongside these people um, using our equipment, their equipment, um, just being able to uh, rack the brains of some of these great people. So we want to make it a little different, too, and stand out uh, in that, you know, those paranormal conventions, uh, some have a theme, but a lot of them just are a good gathering of people. They're great times. People have a lot of fun, um, and the lectures are great. But we wanted to do a focus on this and kind of try to bring this whole history side to the forefront and, uh, you know, let people know that we're here we are at Fort Henry, but not, not just this. Uh, place, you know, you see Fort William Henry and Ghost Hunters and a couple, you know, people have heard about it, things like that, but let's, you know, dive deep into the history of not just this location, but let's focus here while we're here on this location and some of these other great locations that you don't even necessarily uh, hear about or have known about from um, the people that are going to be uh, speaking in at, at the location. So it's, it's turned out to be a, a, a huge event and uh, it's been a, a lot of work, but I think it's going to be quite rewarding and a lot of fun for anybody that comes out. 
And uh, you've got all the information up on GloryHauntHounds.com, including the featured guests like uh, John Zaffis from Haunted Collector, Adam Berry from Ghost Hunters, Joe Chin from Ghost Hunters International. And uh, looking at the ticket packages here, it looks like you have an all-inclusive package available for $300, and that includes three days of activities. Does that include both of the uh, tours of, of the uh, – that includes the tour and the investigation of the fort? Yeah, well, the deal with that, $300 sounds like a lot of money, and it is a lot of money, but that includes two nights, a uh, hotel room. Uh, if you were to go to any hotel room in the Lake George area at the end of April and uh, wanted to spend two nights in the hotel, it, I tell you right now, it will cost you $300. Mm -hmm. So for $300, you get the two nights in the hotel plus the uh, VIP uh, party on Friday, which is an exclusive party uh, with all the celebrities. You get to know them a little bit, hang out. They're going to be there all night from 7 to 12. Um, every hour we're going to be running ghost tours of the fort as well during on um, Friday night. So it includes uh, that, as well as the convention all day Saturday, which is, of course, lectures from all those uh, folks you mentioned, plus many more. Uh, we have two good movies we're going to be screening on Saturday as well. Uh, and, Tim, I don't know if you've seen this here or not, but the movie Please Talk With Me, which is the story of the C2D1 haunting in Geneseo College. No, I haven't and seen it yet. It's an amazing, amazing movie. Uh, I call it uh, an amazing uh, piece of art, really. It's it's fantastic, and it, it's not like any other type of paranormal story or movie um, out there commercially. It's it's, a, it's amazing. I've seen it probably four or five times now, and I'm so proud to be able to um, present this at the Paris History Con. Um, a true story uh, based on the true haunting that happened to Christy Chesare, who's going to be at the Paris History Con. And, uh, he'll be there, uh, actually, um, kicking off the screening of that. And we're also very happy to have the uh, movie called The Shattered Hopes, which is the true story of the Amityville murders. Right. I um, have seen that film. Yeah, well, I think it's I have too. I just saw it recently, and I, I think that's great. It's certainly, I'm, a, I'm kind of an Amityville, kind of my obsession for some reason. I don't, I don't really know why. I'm the same way. <laughs> okay. So then it's just one of those things, like, uh, because they don't allow people to investigate, and, and, and they've been really been in there since the 70s, to do that, uh, it's just been my dream place to go to. So uh, when I talked to Ryan, the uh, director of, of Shattered Hopes, and he agreed to come out and screen that movie, I was really excited. And I, I learned so much that I didn't know uh, that you don't hear about in the media or anywhere else for that matter about, that, about the end of the murders, the murders preceding anything that happened after that with the hauntings and stuff. Uh, you know, I thought it was a pretty eye-opening, so I'm really excited to screen that movie as well. Uh, and then, of course, Saturday night, we're going to have a uh, ghost investigation with all the celebrities. We'll probably have teams of uh, five or six with two celebrities leading each team and, and bringing people to the different locations of the fort. And even a couple locations at the hotel, which has had a lot of activity, um, and the convention center itself. So it's going to be a very full weekend. And like I said, the all-access passes, uh, really just paying for your hotel room. Everything else is basically free if you do it that way. So we did that. We, we, we did that the... Uh, uh, we had to negotiate that quite a bit to get the rate down there, but uh, it worked out, and, and that's really the best way to do it. Um, other than that, uh, you know, we do have individual tickets if you're not able to come out for the whole weekend, but um, I think it's, it's going to be a fantastic time. And boy, we'd, we'd love to have spooky stuff come out and, uh, and join us. Uh, certainly, it would be a, uh, an amazing weekend. That's put you on the spot or anything. Well, you know, if we're already making the drive to North Adams at the beginning of April, then, you know, <laughs> Lake George, New York's not that much further. Exactly. That's what I was thinking. You guys are going to be 40 minutes away from me up at the Houghton. I haven't even been out there yet. So We're, we're, we're going to be seasoned travelers by the time this is going. And I'm going with Moniz. I'm going to have him drive so that I can get there in two and a half hours like he <laughs> promised me. But uh, I can tell you this. I mean, and I always like to say that I'm a psychic as a brick and that I don't really have uh, an intuition necessarily. But I am starting to accept the fact that maybe I can kind of, uh, you know, almost like a like an antenna a little bit for where there might be paranormal activity and, and hauntings and i can tell you that when i was a kid i went and i stayed in lake george uh for a week and i have never stayed in an area that i felt was as creepy as that i thought i was in like castle rock maine i thought i was in a stephen king novel because just the whole area had that vibe to it and i'm just a kid going to like gaslight village and uh <laughs> And I'm feeling all this uh, energy that's happening uh, around that area. And, of course, all those Gaslight Village rides are now down here at Edaville Railroad and yeah. other area parks around here. But, you know, so uh, just the whole area has that, that feel to it. So I wouldn't be surprised to, to find that not only is the, the fort and the hotel haunted, but probably there's tons of places. You could probably go eat at a haunted cafe one morning and drink at a haunted bar the next night. Yeah, when I've uh, made my trips out to Fort Wayne County, they've actually told me there. Uh, you know, just in one conversation, they start mentioning the, the, the lobster pot across the street, and 
a couple places down the road. And you're right, it doesn't have that Stephen King main feel to it. There's a vacation area, and it's just sort of, uh, you know, it's very nice and very welcoming, but sort of this weird, unsettling, unsettling feeling when you, when you go out around there, especially at night. It just has that vibe to it. So I agree. I, mean, I can only imagine. Uh, you know, there was a, for instance, there was a huge um, uh, boat, boating accident out of Lake George where um, lots of people lost their lives not that long ago. And um, I, I was told a story uh, from Fort William Henry, uh, a gentleman by the name Fred Austin, who I had on my show a couple of weeks ago. Uh, talking about uh, how he had a psychic medium out there who, um, you know, became physically ill and sick because there were so many, um, she was a, a person who claimed to be able to pass souls, and there were so many people out there that were just stranded out on the lake um, that she couldn't do it any longer. She physically um, became very ill, uh, it, you know, publicly ill, and it was, she wasn't physically pretty well, so I don't know her abilities in the norm of the person, but um, to have that sort of an effect on somebody just from, uh, something that happened out on the lake in, in, in the uh, Fuller Henry Resort, sits right on the lake. So, uh, the whole, like you said, the whole area just has this strange feeling about it. But it's fascinating, and I can't, you know, I'm really looking forward to the weekend for sure. I mean, I was out there maybe, you know, 20, maybe even 25 years ago, and uh, I'm just wondering if they still have that creepy wax museum out there, too. <laughs> they do. They have like a Frankenstein's Castle kind of place. Yeah, and, like, that was it. These been places like that that are really old school and kind of neat uh, that I, I, you know, as a nerdy adult, I still like going to those places. They remind me of the old uh, amusement parks from the 60s and 70s, you know, but uh, uh, they still have two or three of those places in town, so it's nice. fun. So uh, definitely a lot to keep you uh, interested if you head up uh, to Parahistory Con and, and definitely check it out again. GloryHauntHounds.com is the website to, to purchase tickets and find out more information. And uh, also on the website, that's where people can listen to your, to your show is in addition to on Parax as well, right? That's true. Uh, we do have the complete uh, archive. We're not the complete, but mo- most of the shows are, are, are archived on uh, Going Hunt Hounds. Uh, the end of Keeping the Spirits Alive tab. Uh, of course, Monday nights uh, at 8 o'clock on Parallax, and uh, you can get us as well, uh, just like you guys, on iTunes and Stitcher and all those great places, too. And one of the things that I, I find when you uh, have your episodes archived is everybody's going to go back and start listening to those early episodes and they're going to start asking you questions uh, about the shows that you don't even remember <laughs> so now that uh, a lot of the spooky south coast listeners are going to go check that out or, you know expect an influx of questions where you're going to say uh i'm not sure let me go back and listen to that and i'll get back to you yeah yeah i can already see it like what was that uh, annoying buzz in the back of right. so, like I had to unplug this to plug this in, and then, yeah, I didn't, I don't know. But, you know. <laughs> I, I appreciate more than anything when people out there uh, like to say, I listened to an old episode of the show, and I think I heard an EVP in it. Yeah. But if you can do me a favor when you do that and just send me the clip instead of making me go back and listen to, well, I'm not sure what episode it was. And then I go back, and I'm like, no, no, that's just before we learned how to turn off the network before we came on the air, and we used to just turn the pot down, and then you could still hear it running a little bit in the background. Yeah, I would just tell that probably wasn't an EVP. I might have just had gas that night. I'm not sure. Exactly. You know. Right. So uh, and th- that's one of the other things, uh, Matt Cost, I forgot to mention to you last week. We're going to start doing this. We're going to start. I'm sure you learned this when you went to broadcasting school, Matt. What's that? Mark tape. Did you learn mark tape? No. Okay. Well, we're going to have to start remembering how to do that. All right. We're, you yeah. know, when something's cool and we want to remember it, mark tape. All right. And then we'll either be able to have it for, like, compilations and stuff. Because I went back into some of the archives and tried to find some of, like, our best interview moments and stuff and like it just it was too daunting i was like i'm not doing that <laughs> I, I don't like the way that my voice sounded in that episode but i don't want to listen to it ever again so so mark tape that's the new phrase so if you hear it yeah if anybody says that you know so why don't we have our listeners send in some of their favorite parts because they don't want to listen to me either they don't want to <laughs> go back and hear that i feel like this is going to be a running joke whenever something i feel like it will like be really done. really stupid happens right somebody's going to be like mark tape mark tape well, I think we'll just write each other notes on that. Uh, so, uh, John, I talked about in the first hour, though, about how we have uh, kind of a similar theory uh, about ghosts. And uh, I, even beyond uh, what you think, I'm even starting to change my mind a little bit about some things. Uh, but you are like me. You don't think that there necessarily has to be, uh, you know, a tragic history associated with a location or, you know, somebody dying in a location for there, for there to be paranormal activity. Yeah, that's true. I, I definitely agree with that. And, uh, you know, it's funny because my interest in the paranormal started at a very young age. Uh, and the things that happened to me weren't associated with any particular tragic event or death. They, they were associated, with, you know, I'm still trying to pinpoint exactly why they happened. Um, but I had uh, a kind of a, 
um, not so happy and somewhat tragic childhood, um, but it wasn't centered around um, people around me dying necessarily. But I had a lot of strange events and sort of uh, shadow figures and these weird out-of-body type experiences that I had as a child, but I had no idea were considered paranormal. I thought they were just like everybody else when you're five or six, seven years old, and you don't know any different other than what you're doing. So um, uh, as I grew older and started watching some of the TV shows back uh, when I was a kid, like In Search Of, uh, was a great one. And, oh, yeah. Uh, some of these other uh, other great shows, uh, even like uh, Unsolved Mystery, that's incredible. I mean, one of my most memorable experiences was watching the Haunted Toys R Us story <laughs> from California, and um, that's incredible when I was a kid. Um, and, that, and that rang, that is sort of one of those things that made me think, wow, this is really fascinating. I want to find out what this stuff is. Um, but as I have done research through the years, um, you know, going on 20 some odd years now, um, I've been to so many locations that have never had any history of any death at their location. Um, and that I've never had any tragic events, and yet I'm still getting these amazing, you know, EVPs or strange photos and weird feelings and strange noises. And, you know, it's not to say that the energies that have been left behind aren't from people that have passed away at some point or some place. I just can't draw a feasible connection between all of this information and all of these people, just, uh, all of these spirits or souls or whatever, have you, whatever you want to call them, ghosts, for lack of a better term, coming back to this one particular location. Um, when, you know, you're not getting information particularly on uh, a specific person, uh, and the location doesn't have a history of, of, of that particular person. There's so many people focused, um, as we mentioned a little bit earlier, on trying to contact the deceased person at this location or their uh, tragic event or recalling uh, what happened during this tragic event. But they're sort of forgetting about the other 150,000 people that might have traveled through the halls of this hotel or this school or this hospital. Um, that didn't pass away, but they may have just had a, a particular incident in their life that was emotionally uh, uh, charged uh, with energy and things like that. And, and, and I just, you know, with the way energy works, and Mel and, and, and Moniz can explain better because I'm certainly not a scientist, but the way energy works and the way it's just left behind off of the energy that comes out of the human body at any given time, especially during maybe a confrontation or a heated argument or any event, it, it can be really charged up. And I, and I, I just... I think I'm really starting to lean towards that really being uh, a, a more significant cause to even intellectual or intelligent hauntings. Um, people will say, oh, yeah, of course that happens. It's residual. But um, I could be at a location and, and get these intelligent type responses that I just do not see the connection between that and the deceased person. Um, I don't see any reason or anything other than that's the way everyone has been taught us to think that's what's supposed to be happening here. Um, but it doesn't support it any more than, than, than the theory that Tim, that you and I are going to share here. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm sort of leaning towards a, a more reasonable explanation of just energy uh, re uh, inventing itself, for lack of a better term, and, and coming out, um, you know, and, 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 and interacting that way uh, with us. So I, I, I have a, a, just a real strong uh, belief in that. And, and, and like I said, um, you know, people can say, well, you know, I talked to my Uncle Tom and my Uncle Dave. Well, you know, you ask the question, is this Michael Tom and maybe a piece of glass? But, you know, where's the, where's the facade foundation? Where's the proof behind this? Or how do you know this was Michael Tom? I and mean, how do you know that wasn't just uh, something that was trying to communicate, not necessarily Tom? Mm-hmm. So that's just, uh, like I said, it's an opinion, it's a theory. Uh, I'm not saying that the, the, the all and it all uh, have to be the way it is, but, uh, you know, that's really what I believe. Right. And it could just be telling you uh, what you want to hear so that you'll keep communicating you know it could be saying yes i'm your uncle tom because it doesn't want to be like no i'm not uncle tom and risk you walking away when it's finally got your attention right so you show up and you go to the other room and then you start asking for uncle dave or something so yeah i mean exactly if something's trying to communicate with us to the point where we can actually hear a voice that's not in the room with us um then it certainly would i would guess just like anybody human here uh, if, if i wanted someone's attention bad enough and finally got it um, I would say whatever it took to, for them to keep listening. You know, I mean, in that case, uh, if, if it was that hard for me to get that attention. So, yeah, I mean, it makes sense if you think about it. See, I've started doing something. It drives my wife crazy when I do this. But when we go places, uh, if it's uh, if it's a historic place, I will definitely, you know, pull somebody aside and ask them, you know, uh, great place. Huh? Is it haunted? And because I want to see if there are stories in a place that is a historic spot, just because it does have a rich history. But one of the other things that I've done is I've started asking it when I'm in places where there's a lot of people. Uh, and it could be something as new as, say, TD Garden here with, with the Boston Celtics and the Bruins play. 
uh, I work there a lot as part of my job as a sports writer, and I'll say to some of the security guards, you know, are there, are there stories of ghost activity happening here? And they'll tell me yes. And does that mean that TD Garden is haunted? Probably not. But what it probably means is that residual energy that's left over from all the people that are going there, having a good time or maybe having a, a bad time if your team loses, but they're expelling all that excess energy and it's being trapped and recorded in that location. So it's not surprising to me when a security guard's like, you know, when I'm here alone at night, I can hear voices. Well, of course you can because it's been trapped in there. And it's not a, it's not a haunt, but it's activity. It's paranormal activity. Right, and I guess it just depends on what you consider to be haunt, uh, haunting. I guess right. if, if some of this energy, you know, it, it can tend to, uh, you know, and it's just an, it, it can tend to come off as being uh, an intelligent response as well, uh, and, and it may just be energy left behind. So use the terminology like if you want to call it residual. Um, sometimes it comes off as an intelligent response, but uh, it may very well just be what we determine, what we, you know, if we determine to be a residual, uh, it's left behind energy. Um, and for some reason, you know, I, I do. I see more and more in these places, like you mentioned, a, a big public place like the TD Garden. You know, we wouldn't call it haunted, but just it could be just like any other building. If you want to be tech, you know, if you want to just get technical about the whole thing, or, or not, not necessarily technical, but uh, you know, every place could be haunted if you really wanted to consider mm -hmm. um, the energy that could possibly be left behind. But certainly, no one wants to put, uh, wants to profess that because we don't want to say that oh, every building is haunted, and then suddenly the paranormal becomes boring to everybody because oh no, it goes everywhere whatever you want to call it. So, um, but yeah, I, I certainly, with that many people, I mean, how, you know, even the TV, the newer garden, I mean, there's still thousands of people that have been through there in the last, how, since it's been open. So, you know, um, yeah, buildings like that would be, I would, I would imagine have a, a high level of energy when it finally quiets down. You, you find people are actually able to uh, focus and, and, hear, and hear that stuff. They wouldn't even be able to hear with 20,000 people in the building. And that's kind of just what I tell people all the time when they ask me, you know, do you think my house could be haunted? I say yes, because I think that, uh, you know, paranormal activity happens everywhere, but there's only certain places where the factors are right for us to be able to perceive it. And right. uh, and I find that that, you know, is probably, a, it's not really a reassuring answer for somebody who's like, I don't want to live in a place that's haunted. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. but it's, it's, it's what I think is the most accurate way to describe it. So. Yeah, uh, it if somebody goes around trying to avoid living in a place that's haunted, they're going to have a hard time because it could be anywhere, you know. So. Absolutely. And if, if you're already in a place that's haunted, you could be the reason why. So going somewhere else doesn't really necessarily help. Uh, we are talking with John Tobin of Glory Haunt Hounds. And if you have a question or if you'd like to make a comment about your own investigations in historic spots, then give us a call, 508-996-0500, 996 Email spooky crew at spooky south coast.com or jump into the chat room on spooky TV at spooky south coast.com. We've got a call on the line here, John, so uh, we'll take that if you don't mind. Sure. Good evening. You're on spooky south coast with John Tobin. How are you? Hi, Tim, John, and your crew. Uh, obviously, there was a lot of attention to the uh, film on Lincoln recently. I didn't see it yet, uh, and I wondered if there was any. Um, at all indication of the stories of his psychic dreams predicting his deaths, and whether you gentlemen uh, can recall that. I heard of that years ago, but do you guys recall Lincoln's psychic premonitory dreams and uh, how that played out? I would love to hear more about it, because Lincoln is in such, you know, fashion nowadays. Well, John, did you have a chance to see the film? I did see the film, yes. Um, I enjoyed it quite a bit. Um, I didn't really touch very much on that side of it. Um, it was really focused on the uh, uh, family of the slaves and the proclamation and uh, that sort of side of it. But, but I have heard a lot about, uh, you know, President Lincoln and, and, and his uh, involvement in a lot of the spiritualist movement at that time in uh, conducting seances when his son had passed away and things of that nature. But the film didn't really touch much on that that I can recall. They, they did in the film. They did have uh, a scene where he had one of his uh, prophetic dreams. And they, they did kind of touch upon that a little bit, but they didn't really get into his spirituality and, and into his, his psychic side. But uh, Colin, there's a great book that uh, if you want to check it out, it's called The Psychic Life of Abraham Lincoln. Ooh. And it was written by uh, Susan Martinez. And it's just fascinating. It talks about not only his own uh, paranormal experiences throughout his life, but it talks about his uh, foray into spiritualism as well. 
And there's also, uh, if you go back into the, are you online, caller? Do you have uh, internet capability? Uh, not at the moment. Okay, because we did do a, an episode of the show with uh, Susan Martinez where we talked about the book uh -huh. a few years ago. But uh, definitely check out that book. It's called The Psychic Life of Abraham Lincoln. Now, may I ask this question? If he had a dream predicting his death... He had many. He had more than one. Why, why did he not take, you know, extra precautions, security guards, etc., when his responsibility was to lead the nation even after the war and do it right? Why, why was he lax? The, the answer to that, uh, at least as far as I know, is he felt that if that was what was to be, then that was what was to be. That was the plan. And uh, he also felt, uh, too, that, and this is my own speculation, is that uh, that might have been what his responsibility was, that he, that he had to be sacrificed. Uh, in order to move on to it. So if you if you read the book, it, she does get into a lot of uh, his personal uh, psychology and uh, how, how his makeup might have determined the, the lens through which he viewed his paranormal experiences. And, and was his wife at all psychic herself? Uh, from what I remember from the book, uh, Susan alludes that uh, it could be possible that she was, but she also could have been uh, severely mentally ill as well which uh, would have tainted. And also, I mean, you got to think, too, both of the Lincolns were, were probably severely depressed uh, after the loss of their son, too. Mm. Well, it's so. very very intriguing and loaded with further mysteries, isn't it? Right. I, I definitely would recommend picking up that book. And uh, if you have any trouble finding it, uh, you know, give me a call sometime after the air and uh, off the air, and I'll see if I can find a local bookstore that has it. All right. Thanks for the tip. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Yeah, that, that really was a, a fascinating book. I actually built a lecture uh, around that that I go out and present. And, and people, are, even before the movie came out, you know, Lincoln is probably uh, the paranormal president, you know, even even before. What well, all those vampires he killed. <laughs> yeah. Uh, on a funny side note, I'm actually uh, going to be in a movie with uh, Bill Obis Jr. who played Abraham Lincoln in Abraham Lincoln vs. the Zombies. Nice. So the movie I'm in is where the guy played Abe Lincoln, but I think it might have been, been an intuitive phone call. I'm not sure. <laughs> well, and, and, you know, as much play as Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter got, I don't think there's been enough focus put on uh, the other film that came out, FDR, American Badass. <laughs> no, did you see? Did you see that there was actually uh, uh, Bill Paxton played him or something like that? Uh, no, I think it was Barry Bostwick okay. who played him. I know Barry Bostwick. Barry Bostwick. But uh, yes, and. and uh, <laughs> It's. It looks like it looks. Like, it looks like a much better movie than Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter, in my opinion. I heard it actually came out, but I'm not sure if I believe it. I just. I just on, when I saw the DVD. When I saw the trailer, I expected to see a film by Lloyd Kaufman. <laughs> you know, I just thought it was a trauma picture. Well, if it was a trauma picture, then it would be everywhere. Right. It would be out on DVD or Betamax or whatever. Or Jeremy Rizarkov. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, well, and also, Costa, it, yeah, it's terrible that you don't have television. I know. Because if you have the terrible. Epics channel, which you can get digitally, yep. they have all the trauma films up this month. Do they? Sergeant Kabuki Man, Poultry Guys, but they don't have Tromeo and Juliet. No. No. Uh, so, we're getting off on a side note here. We'll talk about trauma films all night, which, uh, Chris, if you're listening, book Lloyd Kaufman. I tried a few years ago. Uh, now, when we're talking, though, about these different uh, possible... Uh, reasons why a place could, could be haunted, John, why it could have uh, paranormal energy happening. Uh, do you find that in some of these older locations that you go into, uh, you know, you're really solely depending on human energy more than anything uh, to supply the, the power source for these hauntings? Yeah, absolutely, uh, and I agree. Um, you know, we do have, it, it's funny because uh, we, we have all these tools that we bring with us, uh, but really our, our best form of communication is really our minds, our senses, um, and, you know, our physical beings, uh, really. Uh, we're really going to find, I believe, our best evidence, our, our most, most of our experiences from uh, ourselves. Um, we have these tools to try to help detect where the energy levels may be and things like that. And, 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 and to, the, to the point we were talking about before about uh, communicating with uh, energy left behind it as opposed to deceased people, uh, spirits, or whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, there may be, this spirit communication may be possible on a mental or psychic level, but there's not very many people that I'm, I'm familiar with that are really in tune uh, to be able to do that. I, I suppose that is very possible, and I've met a few people that I certainly believe have that capability, at least they've convinced me that they have, but they're few and far between. Um, so 
I, I still think, though, that you know that said that these uh, you know, when we do our investigations, the information that we're getting, a lot of it is just accessory. Um, you know, a K2 meter can bring me to where the level of uh, EMF in the air is higher than another place, but um, my intuition, my mind is going to bring me probably to the place that's going to give me the best results. Um, you know, just trying to concentrate and really be in tune with the location. A lot of that has to do with, um, I think, just has to do with, you know, knowledge of of where you are and uh, what's around you. I mean, it, it just got to follow that. I think a lot of people just sort of rely on these tools, these EMF detectors, these, uh, you know, shadow detection and um, temperature changes and things like that. I think it's relied on way too much, and they sort of leave their intuition behind. And, and that's a shame because that's the best tool we have. Right. And, and the fact that, uh, you know, you've got certain groups that want to eliminate the human element as much as they can uh, because they say that that taints the investigation, but uh, it, it's kind of the tree falling in the woods, you know, argument because if, if you're not there to understand and perceive it, then it may, may not happen. Well, the equipment is just there to augment your natural senses. At least that's, that's all. It's well, supposed to be, but that's too many people swear by the equipment and not by the personal experience. Why not both? Theoretically, well, you're supposed to use both, but... You're talking to a couple of guys and myself and John that agree with that, but not everybody <laughs> you know, will, will follow that, that theory. Well, it's not scientific if you're just using instrumentation. Right, take it from a scientist. That's not right. <laughs> right I, I, you're definitely correct on that, and I would say that, that, that that's a problem, though, that too many people go in and, and, and then literally think that the only way they're going to be able to communicate with anything is through know, these tools. They don't realize that uh, they can use their bodies and minds and thoughts and things like that to communicate and not just, they just rely on that. If they're not getting a hit on their shadow detector or their uh, whatever device of the day, if their haunted trigger object uh, device or, uh, you know, their K2 meter, then they're not having any success. And, uh, you know, we all know that that's not true, um, but unfortunately there's not a lot of folks out there. They're, they, they, you know, they take what I call the Scooby-Doo approach, you know what I mean? Uh, so they, they, they basically go with, you know, whatever they hear on, and see on TV, and that is the only way to do the research. Unfortunately, that's what happens when there's a saturation in, in, in anything. Um, the paranormal certainly is in that spot right now where we're saturated with um, thousands and thousands and thousands of groups that um, really just, you know, buy the equipment and uh, have no idea what it's even used for, and they have no intuition, uh, they have no knowledge of how to use themselves as the primary connection tool in this field and it's sad but uh you know it, it's just the way it is well that's just it the paranormal experience is happening to the experiencer the equipment is just the recording of that event happening to that person exactly yeah definitely and, and one thing that i think needs to kind of be emphasized a little bit with these newer paranormal groups is there's a lot of emphasis on debunking because a lot of paranormal groups grew up in the shadow of taps and, and the ghost hunters program. So there's a lot of emphasis on disproving uh, that something is paranormal. And I think that maybe investigators should go out there and try to look for something paranormal first, you know, have that experience so that you know what it is <laughs> so that when you know that it's not that, you know, I mean, you'll have a, a more clear cut, notion of, of what is truly a paranormal experience and, and that's what's great about going into these haunted locations is because you're not going in there uh, with these historic locations I mean it's because you're not going in there uh, to let the owner of this you know 1700s tavern know if their place is haunted or not you're going in there to experience what is hundreds of years worth of historic haunting and uh, when when you're bringing people into them uh, John as I'm sure you know uh, people uh, at that end of it are far less concerned with proving or disproving the haunting and, and just want to have a cool experience. Yeah, absolutely. And it, and it really becomes about the experience and the possibility of having that experience. Uh, you know, and, and a lot of people uh, won't like this, but a, as a person that uh, puts on events, and as, as residents trips do, and as, as I do, um, when, we be, when we go to these events, we, we become entertainers. Um, and, and, you know, we have our, our shows and stuff. So, you know, we have to be... We are entertainers, and, it, and our entertainment is the paranormal forum. So that's what we're presenting to folks. So, yeah, we want to go and have that experience. Um, when we're doing an event like this and the public's involved, we don't want to go and debunk everything. We want to see what we can find, and then, you know, we can, 
come up and, and have this experience, and later on when we're doing our reviews and stuff, if we're able to debunk that, you know, we can let folks know. But um, the, the point of these events and bringing to these locations and raising this awareness is the hopes of having that experience. And of course, there are certain things that you can debunk right put it on the spot. Um, but, you know, as an event provider and, and, and entertainer, I mean that, if, you know, if someone calls me, oh, you, you did a great job, I had a lot of fun tonight, that's a compliment. I, I, you know, it's a lot of folks that I've talked to and they say, you know, I, you, well, you, I find you really entertaining. They find that as an insult, but it's really a high compliment, I think, if you're putting on events and, and providing uh, a media to, to the folks regarding the paranormal. Uh, I, I find it a high compliment. If someone says to me, you're great, you know, you're entertaining me tonight, I think that would be great. And um, well, it's really the building and the location that's providing the entertainment. But if we can help people to see that, um, then I think it's, it's a really uh, a good thing. And I agree with you. I mean, um, certainly, uh, you know, I, I think if you've, if you've had enough of these experiences that we've determined are paranormal, um, it's, it becomes a lot easier to debunk the ones that are not paranormal. You can even do so much right on the spot and, and, uh, and educate the people you live um, to, to what that is without even having to really go there and... and you know, if, you're, if you have to spend hours and hours to debunk something that, that's paranormal or not, um, you're probably spending too much time on it because it, it becomes a lot more clear-cut and obvious the longer you've really experienced it. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, sure, I mean, we do have a responsibility to some degree of, you know, if somebody takes a picture and they get their camera strap in the shot and they think that they caught a vortex, you know, we can point them out, point out to them, like, okay, look, you caught your camera strap and here's how I can make it happen again, just so that they learn. But, uh, you know, if somebody comes downstairs, uh, you know, if somebody comes up to my floor at the Lizzie Board and Bed and Breakfast and says, you know, well, I was downstairs, I felt something pushed me, you know, I don't want to go downstairs and, and try to figure out what it was that they think it push them you know i don't want to rob them of that experience and that's why our our company is called legend trips because that's what you're doing you know you're not there to, to prove or disprove a haunting you're there to just kind of trip on the legend and Absolutely. i think a lot of people because i'm sure you experienced this uh a lot of people want to go after us and, and and kind of call our motives into question because we are quote unquote making money off the paranormal but i tell people I don't, you know, we they are. Well, here's the thing. Here's, the, here's what I tell them. We don't promise people ghosts. We promise people a good time. That's the only thing we can control is that you will have fun. No, the part about making money, we, we don't make <laughs> it. Right, I understand. But it is, it, I mean, there is profit being made. It's not much, but it is yeah, profit being yeah. made. Although it's going where back does, to the locations. Yeah, I was going to say, where does that profit go? It goes into the next. Event. And we keep a, a, a right on the front page of legendtrips.com. We keep a running tally of how much. Although we do have to add the last event money in there, but we, we keep a running tally of how much money we raise for these locations to so be able to see where it goes. But people don't understand. This is a and John, I'm sure you can verify this. There's a lot of planning that goes into these events, a lot of promotion, a lot of you know work on the ground before you even get overhead, into the spot. Overhead costs. A lot of overhead costs. I mean, these things aren't cheap to put on, and so you're you're being paid, you're making money off your ability to put on a successful event. It has nothing to do with making money and profiteering off the paranormal. Yeah, exactly. And and and, and for everything that looks like a profit, like you mentioned, that looks like a dollar line profit. Uh, it, it really does go back into between travel and, and time and, and, and just equipment and everything else. You know, you, know, you need to, people say, oh, you know, you're, you're spending money on equipment. Well, we have to because we like to provide the equipment for people to use right. at mm-hmm. the event. So if we don't have an adequate amount of equipment, then people are going to say, well, I didn't get to use that, I can do that. So, you know, the number one thing to do in these events is we want to bring them, and, and our job is to find these locations that will give people a, a good, you know, have a, a good possibility of having a great experience paranormally. Um, and then that's our job. If we, if we bring people to a place that doesn't have any paranormal activity any, ever, and we've never been there, and we've never, you know, the number of failing is as, as event providers and entertainers. But you're right. The number one goal is for people to have a good time. If they walk away from the event saying what a great time they had, um, it's second nature if every experience that person, you know, if I think that, the guy next to me's paranormal experience wasn't really paranormal. I don't want to rob him of that. You're right. I mean, uh, if we want to discuss that offline after the event and talk about what may not have or may have been paranormal, that's fine. I'm definitely always open for that, and I, and I welcome that discussion. And that's and what we want to do. But we want everybody the night of the event to have as much fun as possible. Uh, and me as the event host, if that's not happening, then I'm telling as an event provider, and, 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 and it has nothing to do with... Um, 
what's real and what's not real in the paranormal. Um, that stuff will come if we go about it the right way. And I think that what Legend Trips does, and I think what we do, uh, we have the right approach. So I think that we're going to get a lot, uh, a lot of great results. And in, in turn, you know, we've done our research and locations where we're holding these events on. Um, it's been very, we've been very lucky and very successful so far. So, uh, you know, hopefully it continues that way. And it is nice when you can kind of throw it back in the accusers' faces and say things like, you know, like we can say, we kept the lights on at the New Bedford Military Museum all winter long. We kept the heat going for them all winter long, where they otherwise would have had to close for the season because they couldn't afford the heating bill. We replaced the floors in the Fearing Tavern. You know, what have you done for the paranormal people? You know, when you want to, you're asking these locations to let you in for free to get in there and investigate. What what good is that doing them? You know, we're we're providing them the ability to keep these buildings up, and then this is a, a a controlled way to bring people in and have them investigate without it causing any problem. Imagine if you know some of these locations, John, open their doors up to any paranormal group that wanted to come in. How long do you think it would take before they'd say, "All right, no more of that"? You know, and some of them do, and and then and that's and that's great if they feel like they can do that. But unfortunately. Um, there are a lot of other locations that, that, that charge money. People seem to, I've, I've heard it time and time again, oh, boy, I hate to pay for plays, and I hate this, and they're ruining the paranormal by charging people money to go in there. Well, you know what? What is this abandoned hospital going to do? Um, if they're experiencing paranormal activity and they've had a lot of reports of different things happening, uh, they're either going to open the doors for a thousand groups to go in there and get nothing out of it other than spending the money, their own hard-earned money on their heat and their electricity and everything else that these teams are using, or they're going to charge a minimal fee to have people come in and use the facility and keep it open. I mean, I, I just don't see the harm in that if it's going back into keeping the location open and allowing us to do our research. So, yes, by us doing all the events that we do, uh, we're doing so much uh, by raising just the awareness of people. People sometimes have not even heard of these buildings. They don't even know they exist. And we bring them in there, um, there's not going to be an opportunity for 40, 50, or more people to come to this location and gather around and hear the history and, and listen to the people talk and use this equipment. And, and we're opening the doors for the people that possibly experience these things. So, you know, I, I, I you know, we're not, I'm sh you're not, Tim, I know you're not, and I'm not either tooting our horns here, but I'm just saying uh, for people that, see this as, as a bad thing or a downside in the paranormal, um, they need to just think about what it is. They're, like you said, what are they doing to uh, help these places? And like I said, I'm a history lover first, um, so that's my main goal. I'm definitely, if I'm making any money, my wallet's not reflecting off of it. It's really, <laughs> about, uh, it's really about experiencing this stuff with people that don't normally have that opportunity. And, we, you know, your events, you keep the cost low, we keep the cost low, we just cover what we have to do um, to bring people to these locations and, and, and be able to participate ourselves, really. And I can tell you, I've, I've done the math, and the hourly wage that I make for the time that I put into Legend Trips and that, you know, Jeff pulls in for the hourly wage he puts into the events uh, wouldn't be enough to it's, – it's not even a minimum wage job. I mean, it's, 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 it's like – it's what I made when I first started working <laughs> when minimum wage was like three seventy five an hour. Absolutely. And so uh, – but again, let's let people know here before, because we are coming up uh, on the end of the show, but uh, let's let everybody know about the, the Yankee Peddler Inn investigation. That's next uh, Saturday? Yes, next Saturday night, uh, Yankee Peddler Inn, March 9th. It starts around 6.30. Uh, we're gonna do, I'm going to do a little lecture on the history of the hotel and a little bit about uh, some of the things we talked about tonight. I like to interact with people and get their opinion on what the ghost is, and we, we kind of joke around and go back and forth, keep it a little light and have fun. Um, then we're going to actually do a screening of the movie The Innkeepers, which was filmed in and, in and out about the uh, Yankee Peddler Inn. Oh, nice. And following that, we will, uh, uh, and once we get people spooked out a little bit, then we're going to start our investigation that will go to the wee hours of the morning. And the room ticket, uh, very low priced uh, for a double walking to and $75 a person includes your room. Wow. So, you know, you can't really beat that out there, I, I tend to think. And uh, um, that'll be a lot of fun on Saturday. That's, that's good just for, an, you know, just for a night out, night away from the kids. Yeah, I think so. I'm looking forward to it. Not away from the kids. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, uh, the Para History Con is is coming up uh, April 26th through the 27th uh, up there at uh, Fort William Henry around the Lake George area. And uh, you know, if anybody goes out to that creepy wax museum, you know, send us some photos because I want I want to see if it's still as weird and freaky as I remember. Yeah, absolutely. That's going to be a great event. Uh, we're really looking forward to that. And uh, there'll be more events coming up, too. Uh, we're going in June, potentially, at a place called the Old Stone Fort here in Schoharie, uh, New York, which is uh, 
very new to letting people uh, come out there, and not very many people have been out there, so uh, we're looking forward to that as well. Uh, details on uh, GloryHuntHounds.com and all that stuff. All right, well, definitely keep us up to date with everything that's going on, and uh, we'll keep checking in with you as well, and I'm sure uh, our paths will cross sooner or later uh, out there in the field, and we'll have to work on trying to investigate some of these haunted locations, these historic haunted locations together sometime. Absolutely, we'd love that, and uh, we'll stay in touch, Tim, and uh, hopefully we'll get together soon. All right, thanks. Have a great night. You too, thank you. Bye bye. That is John Tobin of Glory Hunt Hounds. You can check out his website, GloryHuntHounds.com. That's where you can uh, pretty much find all the information about the radio show, uh, Keeping Spirits Alive. You can find out information about Parry History Con, uh, about their events. You can get tickets to everything right there. So that's the go to spot uh, for everything there. And, and it's great that somebody else uh, understands. You know, the same perspective that we're coming from with what we do with Legend Trips and what we do with our own forays into the paranormal, and that's preserving the history of these locations and keeping people interested in our own history. So uh, if only we could get some of these historians on board uh, with what we're doing. But it's it's great to me, just as a, as a quick example, you know, when we kind of go and, and we, we talk almost, we almost talk for it, Tabor, into letting us have an event there. And then they see how great the paranormal community is. And then, you know, the director starts showing up at my lectures. And and you know, they're like, how soon can you right. come back? <laughs> and, and because that just shows that it's the perfect, uh, perfect relationship between the paranormal community and the historic community. So uh, we'll definitely keep exploring those uh those avenues throughout the year. Uh, again, Haunting the Houghton is the current event up on legendtrips.com if you want to check that out. Next week, the rumor is Chris Balzano here in the studio. So uh, you want to check that out. We'll be here next Saturday night at about 10, 15 p.m., depending on how soon we can get all this tech up and running. Uh, and until then, if you need to get in touch with us anytime during the week, on Twitter, at SpookySC, uh, on Facebook, Spooky South Coast on Facebook, and, of course, the main way, SpookySouthCoast.com. Uh, all of our past episodes are up there. We'll have this one up there as well. And don't, don't make me go through the archives. Mark tape. All right, so until next week, we want you all to stay spooktacular. The station the South Coast turns to for local news talk, weather and sports. AM 1420, BSM New Bedford. AM 1420, WBSM. From NBC News. I'm Todd F. A woman in her 80s died Tuesday allegedly after a nurse's refusal to do CPR. ABC's Chuck Sievertson has more on this intense story. The nurse at Bakersfield, California's